Hi, um, and I'd like to um, thank Carol and Ifer and all the people who helped uh, organize this, which has already proved to be an um, exciting and fun few days back at Amherst. Um, okay, my um, presentation, which is <laughs> still a work in progress, I was working on it this morning to incorporate some things from yesterday. Um, it's going to kind of mimic my career because I'm going to start off talking about literature uh, and then segue into crazy theories about gay people in Russia. Um, <laughs> which is exactly what I've been working on lately. So, I'll start with these two quotations. We have no sex, which was sex uh, will not be categorically против этого. A woman from Leningrad in an American Soviet television bridge. Um, and then when it comes to homosexuals, let's keep Russia clean. We have our own traditions. That kind of contact between men is a foreign import. Valentin Rasputin, well-known Soviet writer. Um, of course, neither of these quotations is true. Russians, even Soviet Russians, did have sex, and <laughs> Russians, even Soviet Russians, also were homosexuals. The woman from Leningrad, who asserted that we had no sex, serves as an index of the sexophobia of the Soviet Union and the lack of discourse about sex. And at the same time, um, a kind of ignorance about homosexuality allowed Rasputin to claim that it was a foreign import, and this is a very popular idea now. I'm going to focus on two writers for the first half, uh, two writers and two manifestos, which you actually have in your, in your packet if you want to read it in your own time. Um, what I'm calling two manifestos um, that demonstrate that there was a homosexuality, even a very erudite homosexuality, both before the revolution of 1917 and in the late Soviet period. Only censorship, sexophobia, and silence prevented them from being known. So the first text is from Mikhail Kuzmin's coming out novel, Wings, published in 1906. <coughs> Wings was the first Russian coming out novel, perhaps the first European one. Kuzmin, as his biographers put it, was engaged in a project without precedent in Russian and for that matter, Western European literature at his time, living an openly gay life, making it a central subject of his art and writing about it with absolute candor. Written in 1904 to 1906, Wings tells this coming-of-age story of Vanya Smorov, who discovers his homosexuality and comes to terms with it, overcoming his doubts and hesitations. At the conclusion of the novel, set in Italy, the conclusion is set in Italy, he agrees to live with his mentor, Larion Strupp, and opens the window onto a street flooded with bright sunlight. The image of opening the window at the end of the novel functions much as the later American expression coming out of the closet, but Kuzmin emphasizes the beauty of what Vanya opens the window onto, rather than the gloom of what he's coming out of. What I'm calling Kuzmin's manifesto is experienced by Vanya. The setting is an evening at Stroop's house with like-minded guests, all men. Vanya finds the company curiously attractive, though he doesn't yet understand why. The manifesto itself is marked off as a speech Though there's no indication at this point of who the, who the speaker is. It's just sort of plunked into the novel whole. It would be easy to assume that the thoughts expressed are Kuzmin's. Only later in the novel does Vanya refer to some lines as having been pronounced by Stroop. So a very articulate gay voice, Kuzmin's, was published and quite well known in Silver Age Russia before, 19, before the 1917 revolution. When the Bolsheviks came to power, the law prohibiting sodomy, which had been enforced only rarely, vanished from the Soviet penal code. Though this change was touted by some Soviet sexologists abroad as a progressive achievement, there was no evidence of much positive change in the lives of Soviet homosexuals like Kuzmin. Homosexuality certainly vanished from Russian literature, and gay life appears to have gone underground. By 1933, Stalin weighed in against homosexuality, and it was recriminalized. Again, the jury is still out on how and why exactly, though by this time, if uh, once Stalin made his opinion clear, all debate stopped. Shortly thereafter, the measure was placed in its international ideological context in a propaganda piece, Proletarian Humanism, by Maxim Gorky, and published in both Pravda and Izvestia, the main papers. We already have the sarcastic saying, he says, destroy the homosexualists and fascism will disappear. And I'll come back to this word homosexualist. Um, the links between homosexuality, espionage, fascism, and bourgeois corruption of Soviet youth 
did not bode well for homosexually inclined men in the Soviet Union. The new law, paragraph 154, provided a sentence of up to five years for consensual sodomy. Dan Healy estimates some 25,000 men were convicted while the law was in effect from 1934 until 1993. Yevgeny Kharitonov's entire life unfolded under threat of this law, and he writes about that threat in some of his works. Though he befriended many important underground writers, Kharitonov's writing was never published in his lifetime. It came out only after the fall of the Soviet Union. Although Gorbachev's glossness in the late 80s allowed for publication of formerly taboo writers and mentioning of homosexuality, gay literature was still not very printable. In 1993, though, uh, the sodomy law, now paragraph 121, was removed from the new criminal code, and Kuzmin's Wings was republished for the first time in Russia. That same year, Kharitonov's works came out in a two-volume collection. The presentation of Kharitonov's book at the Moscow Writers' Club was the event of the year among Moscow's gay circles. So a bit about the manifestos. Kuzmin and Kharitonov's manifestos have much in common. Uh, we are barren, fatal flowers, echoes, we are Hellenes. Kharitonov's flowers, like Kuzmin's Hellenes, are compared to Hebrews. Both are non-procreative, both associated with beauty, but not straight beauty, which they call vulgar lust, uh, the carnal and the bloody. And I would argue that in their appeal to religious and philosophical ideals, these manifestos are also distinctly Russian. Brian Baer would write this up to the Russian image of the spiritual homosexual. Yet they also appeal to an ethnic model of homosexuality, which we usually think of as Anglo-American or Western. <coughs> While many Rus American and Russian scholars of same-sex desire, uh, myself not accepted on occasion, have argued that there was no gay identity in Russia, one thing these manifestos do is define exactly that. Both Kuzmin and Kharitonov frame their arguments in terms of the quintessential communal identity, nationality. Hellenes, Hebrews, like Jews, we, these are what they say. If gays do not identify with a community, why do both Mikhail Kuzmin, Kuzmin and Yevgeny Kharitonov frame their arguments in terms of nationality? It's clear to me from their other writings that Kuzmin and Kharitonov both subscribed to a gay identity and gay sensibility, and that these were expressed in their art. Ultimately, the manifesto suggests Russian gay identity may have been less other than we were first led to believe. Now I want to fast forward a little bit and tell you about what happened after, what happened since then. Um, I mentioned that gay literature appeared in the 90s. Um, so did gay clubs and gay journals. LGBT people became visible suddenly, just at the time when Russia was suddenly exposed to the onslaught of uncensored Western culture, and at the same time attempting Western-style economic reforms. When the economy collapsed in the late 90s, so did the infatuation with all things Western. Russians felt emasculated by the fall of the Soviet Union and the collapse of Russia as a major world power. So we went from a, bipol a bipolar world to a unipolar world, as we heard yesterday, and now, Putin to the rescue, <laughs> uh, to save Russia from being emasculated. <laughs> Russia's new self-image recaptures an endangered masculinity. At first, this was about power internally and Putin's image, but especially since Putin's return to the presidency in 2012, an aggressive heteronormativity <coughs> and political homophobia have become part of the official ideology of Putin's new Russia, while LGBT people are associated with the hated West. Now Russians can look back and say that there were no gays um, in the Soviet Union. They only appeared in the 90s, at the time of the disastrous Western influence. Therefore, they're easy to paint as a Western experiment and othered as an import. So Masha Gessen puts it this way, gays are the perfect other, better than Jews because nobody knows one. <laughs> And the beautiful thing about queers is that queers don't exist. So now I want to talk a little bit about how they are erased, erased um, and it, it's in part through using this word homosexualist. So Russians increasingly refer to LGBT people as homosexualists rather than homosexuals. Um, Kandakov, who I think uh, spoke here, and Laurie Essig refer to homosexualism as an ideology. Um, homosexualism can be adopted, can be propagated, can be promoted. It's like communism, and I'll come back to that, too. Um, 
Plus, they subscribe to a kind of radical universalism, most Russians. Uh, they believe that anyone can become gay. You can become gay by being um, exposed to gay propaganda. You can be, become gay by just being kissed by someone. Um, and there are people who actually believe this. Um, so, and everyone could be become gay. So the danger is everyone will become gay with disastrous effects for demograph the demographics. Okay, um, now I wanted to come back to Pussy Riot <laughs> briefly, whom we also saw yesterday. Um, and the connection here is, although, although we didn't hear that yesterday, the um, part of the punk prayer was uh, one of the lines of the punk prayer was uh, gay pride at Prague in Sibir. Uh, gay pride is sent to Siberia in chains. So this was part of their song against the patriarch and, and Putin. Um, and someone asked yesterday about why, why the trial was allowed. Um, and I would say uh, because they were allowed to defend themselves and they used feminist terms, um, etc. Um, it may look like a trial to us, but I would echo, again, what Sergei Glebov said yesterday and say that it wasn't really a trial, it was an event of a juridical type. Um, <laughs> the arguments don't really matter, everyone knew what the result was, and the result was they were still sentenced to two years in a labor colony. Um, they were sentenced for hooligan hooliganism based on religious hatred, Article 213. They discussed charging them with Article 282, which is extremism and hate crimes. Hate crimes can be based on hatred based on religion, nationality, or membership in a social group. Now you would think that this hate crime law, based on membership in a social group, could be used against gay hate crimes. But in many cases it can't, because experts come in, and experts have testified in court in Russia, that gay people are not members of a social group. They are not a group. It's just something that can happen to you, like an ideology. So another way of um, erasing homosexuals is through the propaganda law, which I have here. Um, propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations, uh, distribution of information. So this was a law added to a, basically an internet law to protect children, and they just added this part. Um, anything that uh, gives the false impression of the social equality of traditional and non-traditional sexual relations among minors. In other words, you can't talk about homosexuality unless you also claim that it is worse than heterosexuality, um, which would have been difficult for someone like Masha Gessen who was raising children with her own partner. Um, okay, so this was, everybody remembers the adoption of this law in 2013. <coughs> That same year, uh, demonstrations in neighboring Ukraine came to a head over Yanukovych's decision to delay entry into an agreement with the European Union while flirting with increased ties with Russia. Ukraine's population was confronted with the choice, Europe or Russia. Russia prop Russian propaganda, even on the main Russian TV channels, consistently described decadent Europe through, the crisis, through this crisis as Geropa. So instead of Europa, it was Geropa, and this shows the Yevromaidan. Uh, Geropa is our everything. This is one example. Um, here's another uh, comparison, expectations versus reality. So on the left is what you expect in Europe, on the right is reality, which is an interesting uh, mix of gay parades and Islam. And here's another one, uh, which way should Ukraine go? Um, so, uh, on the right is Russia, and on the left is uh, Europe. You can find a lot of these. Um, they sometimes played on the punning rhyme that the way to Europe was through the ass. Um, um, this text was used in an anti-Ukraine roundup on Dmitry Kisilyov's News of the Week. Uh, this guy is not a marginal figure. He is the head of Russia Today. He's the head of all media now. Um, and this is what he was broadcasting um, in the Ukraine crisis. Um, and here's another, perhaps uh, Michael can use the next one. Uh, Ukraine, Geropa is waiting for you, kiss, kiss. Um, this manages to combine anti-Westernism along with uh, homophobia and racism. Okay, um, within Russia, since the adoption of the law, 
surveys have increasingly found that homophobia in Russia has returned to pre-1990 levels. While the law is rarely enforced per se, it does encourage gay bashers. So here you see 1989, um, 1999, the, the gray there is people who don't think that gays should be liquidated or isolated. That was way up in 1999, and in 2015, it's way down again, and it's even farther down in a more recent survey. Um, so one of the, uh, while the law is rarely enforced, it encourages gay bashers, and this is another thing uh, that people probably heard about. One of the earliest groups was called Occupy Pedophiliae, whose members lured gay people to meetings, then beat and humiliated them, filming everything and posting it on social media. Some of these guys have been charged, um, others have not. And my colleague Alexander Kandorkov, who I think uh, gave a talk here, who did a survey of criminal cases involving gay victims and found that indeed there was an uptick of violence against LGBT Russians after 2013 when the law was adopted. So you can see 2013 and then it goes up, and I think it's gone up even more since. Um, and these are just cases that came to trial and they're from all over Russia. Uh, a little bit about Chechnya because the la for the last year, people have also heard about this. Uh, because of Chechnya's special place in Putin's consolidation of power, Putin loyal loyalist uh, Ramzan Kadyrov can run his <coughs> republic with relative impunity. Um, in April of last year, Novaya Gazeta printed stories of a wave of arrests and murders of gay men who were kept in prisons and tortured, and it was too much to ignore. First, there were denials. Um, people. Uh, Kadyrov insisted there were no gays in Chechnya, so how could they be arrested and tortured? There aren't any. Um, human rights officials in the Republic insisted they had received no complaints from gay people, uh, but that families would be right to kill them if they did complain. Uh, the human rights officials. Um, Western leaders pressed Putin. Putin asked Kadyrov directly, uh, but there were still only denials and claims that the whole thing was fake news. Victims who were eventually evacuated were afraid to speak because the Chechen diaspora is everywhere. Uh, the first victim to come forward uh, was in fact a Russian, this Maxim Lopunov, the only person that we've really um, seen. He worked in Chechnya and he was not afraid to be outed to his family unlike, because he's Russian, unlike most of the Chechen victims. Um, there were sensational stories about Chechnya running special concentration camps for gays. Um, that was a little bit of an exaggeration because the prisons had previously existed and the torture had previously existed just for other people, and now they were, they were using it on gay Chechens. Um, the Russian LGBT network has been helping the victims and their relatives, and they've heard of many people who were handed over to relatives and vanished. But as of now, 114 have been evacuated from Chechnya and 92 have left the territory of Russia. Some have received asylum in the EU or Canada. Russian human rights ombudsman Moskalkova went to Chechnya and claimed to find only that some of the victims, supposedly, had died earlier of natural causes. Um, only Human Rights Watch and Russia LGBT network seem to be capable of finding the actual people. So now I'm going to head towards a conclusion. Since at least the middle of the 2000s, and this is uh, perhaps uh, in response to what Karen was saying yesterday about you know, what is Russia's ideology, I, I think uh, many people think that they do have now an ideology, um, and it's basically traditional values. The traditional values, in other words, anti-West, anti-gay, um, have become the national idea of Russia, deployed internally as a populist ideology to unify Russia, and externally as a kind of exceptionalist um, messianic pose to present Russia as the savior of Europe, and the lead leading defender of true European <coughs> values, which are defined through the traditional heteronormative family. Uh, thus, homophobia is at the heart of Russia's self-identification in opposition, in opposition to the decadent LGBT-friendly West, as well as at the heart of Russia's geopolitical strategy, which unites like-minded traditionalist forces behind Russia, thereby both gaining international status as a world leader and destabilizing the EU by supporting right-wing dissenting factions in Europe. One of the places this happens is through something called the World Congress of Families, which the Human Rights Campaign calls the largest and most influential organization involved in anti-LGBT policies worldwide. Just out of curiosity, has anybody heard of the World Congress of Families? <sighs> yeah. Um, it was founded by an American and some Russians in 1995. It's based in the US. It has been supported by um, 
George W. Bush. Uh, and in the, since about 2014, it's become increasingly Russian. Um, the World Congress of Families 8, or its substitute, uh, was held in Moscow in 2014. It was called the International, International Forum Large Families and the Future of Humanities. And it was held inside the Kremlin and inside the Church of Christ the Savior, which we saw yesterday, which is where Pussy Riot <coughs> performed. Um, and this, again, shows the contemporary sort of symphonia, Byzantine symphonia that we were talking about yesterday. Um, the church and the state together, this is what they are supporting. Um, the World Congress of Families is a veritable homophobe international, that's what I like to call it. Um, now the head is uh, Brian Brown, whom you may remember as the head of the National Organization for Marriage. Uh, basically they realized the marriage equality war was lost in the US, and so he has taken his show abroad. Um, the World Congress of Families uh, International Organization of the Family uh, has clearly has the support of the Russian government, uh, Russian politicians, and the Russian Orthodox Church, and financial support of major funders, and I'll give you some of the Russian ones here. Scott Lively is also one of the participants. He's, he's uh, the uh, man who is sometimes uh, charged with responsibility for Uganda's Kill the Gays bill, um, so he's involved in this, and he's also gone to uh, Kyrgyzstan and various other countries in uh, former Soviet Union to promote uh, homophobia and to promote laws like Russia has, um, has adopted. So here are some of the Russians who have uh, supported the World Congress of Families. Uh, Yekunin, Vladimir Yekunin, uh, Konstantin Malafiev, who supports all kinds of right-wing things and may have been behind the uh, attempted coup in Montenegro, so he supports far-right far right parties across Europe. Alexei Komov, very interesting figure. He is, uh, the, calls himself the ambassador of the World Congress of Families to the UN. <coughs> Anatoly Antonov, one of the founders of the World Congress of Families, who is at Moscow State University in the sociology department, which is a, a, one of the sources of homophobia in Russia, is the sociology department of Moscow State University. Dmitry Smirnov, who is a very visible uh, Orthodox priest, um, he's on television a lot. Alexander Dubin, who is the major Eurasianist. So all of these people are involved in this in this movement. Um, and in in Europe and elsewhere, these are some more people who have been involved in the World Congress of Families and associated with the people, the Russians that, that are networked with uh, the World Congress of Families on the previous page. So. Marine Le Pen of the Front National in France, uh, Viktor Orban, currently the Prime Minister of, of Hungary, uh, the last World Congress of Families was held in Budapest, Igor Dadon, the President of Moldova, the next World Congress of Families is going to be in Chisinau, uh, Livan Vasadze uh, from Georgia, he's a financier but also a crusader uh, for the family, uh, Georgia had the previous two uh, previous to Budapest World Congress of Families, and Boško Obradovic from Serbia, who's in the Dmeri party, and then Brian Brown of, uh, of the US. So um, the way this works is, in terms of their ideology, Russia will save Europe and European civilization. They're the true defenders of, of Europe. Um, first, it, first, Russia will save Europe from gender, which is not really what you think it is. It's a, it's a term that refers to all kinds of things that these far-right um, and anti-gay and anti-feminist people oppose, um, like sex education, abortion, LGBT rights. It's all sort of together, and they just call it gender, or they call it gender ideology. Um, and so gender ideology, which isn't really a thing, and some of my colleagues wrote a book called Gender as Symbolic Blue, because what it does is it unites all of these uh, right-wing parties across Europe uh, in their hatred of gender or gender ideology. Um, and remember I said homosexual, homosexualism is an ideology, and the, this idea has finally come full circle, so this year I finally found someone who said, in Russian referred to that uh, pernicious European gender ideology of homosexualists. So that's how you kind of package all of the, 
all of the bad things into one into one thing. So, unfortunately, um, so long as Russian geopolitical goals remain aligned with it, its role as the leader of global homophobia, Russia's support for and participation in the World Congress of Families, um, this movement is likely con to continue, and its influence is likely only to increase. Thank you.